Hi there, my name is Spencer Exani. I'm a postdoc here at MIT. Actually, I did my master's and my PhD here as well, and part of my master's project was designing and developing these Cosmic Watch desktop muon detectors. So the videos that I'm going to show here are going to show you how to actually use the detectors. We'll probably go through some example measurements and how to update the software, as well as some information regarding how to actually take proper data. So these detectors are not only good cosmic ray muon detectors, they're actually great background detector detectors as well. They're able to measure beta ray emission from, say, the uranium decaying in the concrete holding up this building, or gamma ray emission, say, from the potassium-40 decaying in my body. However, their primary purpose was to actually measure a pure sample of cosmic ray muons. And with a pure sample of cosmic ray muons, there's a lot of interesting physics you can actually do. So here is one of the detectors. And to actually power them on and start taking data, you simply actually have to plug in a micro USB connector to either your computer, a power bank, or a wall outlet. They'll begin by booting up. They'll start off by introducing themselves. This detector's name is Becquerel. Your detector will probably have a different name. And then, as soon as they're done introducing themselves, they'll start actually measuring events. So each one of these flashes that you see is a different event that's triggering the detector. So some of this might be beta rays or gamma rays or cosmic ray muons. And I can tell you that at sea level here in Boston, the background, or sorry, the uh, cosmic ray muon rates for this particular detector uh, will be about 0.5 hertz. You can see if you look at the rate indication at the bottom, it looks like the, the actual measured rate is about 3.2 hertz. So the remainder is actually background, background rate. Now you might be wondering what this orange plate is behind me. This is actually a Fiesta Ware plate made before 1974. Uh, Fiestaware used to actually coat their plates in a uranium oxide that's, that is pretty radioactive. And so actually if you take your detector and place it near a radioactive source, you can see the trigger rate dramatically increases. So you can find data relating to this plate if you like on the GitHub repository along with a lot of other really cool measurements. Besides background radiation, we're actually uh, aiming to measure a lot of things associated with cosmic ray muons. And that's actually why uh, we've supplied two cosmic ray muon detectors to you. So the cosmic ray muon detectors can be connected together through the coincidence cable. This is just a standard Ethernet cable. Once they're connected together and a single one of them is powered on, they will both boot up in what's called coincidence mode. And that was that bright flash, flash that you saw at the beginning. So in coincidence mode, when one detector sees an event, or you see the top, the top light flashes, it sends a, a, a command through this cable to the other detector so that this detector can, can also determine whether or not it saw an event at the same time. And so if you watch closely, occasionally you see this bottom LED flash, like there. And that, that flash at the bottom indicates that that was a coincident event. So what those are is, uh, those are cosmic ray muons, actually, that are triggering both detectors at the same time. So cosmic ray muons, they originate in the upper atmosphere. They're continuously showering down on us, sort of like a light rain. And these cosmic ray muons are very penetrating. They're able to travel kilometers through, through the ground. That's why we, as particle physicists, put our detectors kilometers underground, is to shield our detectors from these, this, this particular set of radiation. So what happens is as a cosmic ray muon travels down, it will go through the first detector, trigger it, go through the second de detector, trigger it, and continue on its way. And that's what we call a coincident event. OK, so the way that these actually work is there's a piece of plastic scintillator in here, along with a single photon detecting device. So a plastic scintillator, when a charged particle passes through the plastic scintillator, it's going to emit photons. And as these photons are emitted, they might bounce around or scatter or be absorbed by the, the, the bulk material. But some of them will run into the single photon detector. The single photon detector is a silicon photomultiplier, or what I'll call a SIPM. So SIPMs uh, are going to measure this incoming radiation or this incoming light that's emitted from the scintillator, and the, they'll send out a pulse whose height is a uh, pulse of current whose height is proportional to how many photons it actually saw. So if we can determine somehow how high that pulse is, we're able to essentially count the number of photons that were emitted. And I'll tell you that the number of photons emitted in scintillator is going to be related to the energy deposited in the scintillator. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take these detectors and I'm going to show you what the actual pulse of current out of the SIPM looks like. 
Okay, so now we have our two detectors here. And before I talk about these, let me just briefly mention what these two over here are, are measuring. Uh, so I have two detectors here that are set up in coincidence. They're just being powered by this, uh, this USB power bank in the back. And uh, they, I've inserted this brick of lead in between the two detectors. So what's going on here is every once in a while, you'll see that there's a coincidence signal. So those are the two bright uh, red flashes that you'll see occasionally. Uh, and whenever you see one of those, like, like just there, that was a muon traveling through this first detector, traveling all the way through this, this brick of lead and through the second detector, triggering both detectors simultaneously. Um, so uh, I'm just going to leave that running. We're not actually going to use that data right now. Um, right now, what I'd like to show you is uh, how the red pitaya can connect up to these. So here's the red pitaya. It's essentially just an oscilloscope. You can see on the two inputs, the 250 ohm inputs, I've connected two, uh, I think these are six inch SMA connectors. And we're going to run this, the, the SMA connectors into our two detectors. So maybe I'll put channel one to red and channel two to white. For the SMA connectors, you want them to be uh, relatively tight. Uh, please avoid stripping the actual connections. They're threaded, uh, and we really don't want them to be stripped because there'll be quite a bit of work to actually replace. However, if they're loose, if they're not fully connected, uh, they'll introduce noise into the waveform that you might actually be able to observe. Okay, with these connected up, um, what we can then do is go over to our red pitaya and look at these signals coming out of the detector. Great, so we have our red pitaya loaded up. I'm going to click on the oscilloscope. It's going to boot up the oscilloscope function on the red pitaya. It looks like channel one is connected into the first input. Uh, sorry, the red detector is connected into channel one. The white detector is connected into channel two. Uh, if I look on my oscilloscope, I can see channel one is currently set up to one volt per division. We're going to want to increase that to 20 millivolts per division. So I click on channel one and increase the scale to 20 millivolts per divi division. I can see channel two is also one volt per division. Let's increase that one to 20 millivolts per division as well. Okay. Now the horizontal scale is time, and I can see that it's one millisecond per division. I want that to be about one microsecond per division. So I'm going to zoom in in time. Okay. The next thing we want to do is we want to set up a trigger. So if I click on the settings for the trigger, I'm going to trigger on channel one. So that's the red detector the rising edge of the pulse, and let's set a trigger at 10 millivolts. Okay, And I'm going to select normal so that what happens is every time the waveform passes the trigger threshold, 10 millivolts, it's going to update the screen. And actually, you can see it if you look at the red detector here. Every time you see a flash here, the screen on your computer should update as well. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select single. And so rather than update every time that there's a uh, waveform that passes the threshold, it will freeze on the next event. So if I hit run, it will look for the next event. There it is. Okay, great. Now what we're going to look for is we're going to look for waveforms that come in and, that come in and trigger the detectors simultaneously. So these are the coincident events. Um, so occasionally, some of these pulses here, some of these triggers, some of these pulses here, will arrive at the exact same time. Those are coincident events that are triggering, making these bright red lights, bright red flashes that you're seeing between detectors. So if I hit uh, run a couple of times, I should come across a coincident event. Um, a more likely way to select coincident events is to raise the threshold. It turns out that uh, muons actually deposit more energy uh, into each detector than the average gamma ray background. Uh, so as we raise the threshold here, we're looking at higher energy interactions in the detector, which are more likely to be muon. So maybe I set to 30, 30 millivolts. Now when I hit run, I might have to wait a bit longer for the screen to update. But these have a much higher probability of being cosmic ray muon interactions. So here's one example. So you can see both, the trigger, both, both detectors triggered at the same time. Input one and input two both show a pulse in coincident with each other. Had you been watching the coincident LEDs here, uh, you would have noticed that for this particular event, those two red lights would have flashed at the same time, uh, and that event that was saved to the detector would have been labeled as coincident. Great, so we plugged in the detectors. We showed how to set the detectors up in coincident mode. I've shown how to extract the raw signal from the SIPM, if you're interested, uh, with an oscilloscope or the red pitaya. 
in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at some of this data. I'll give you some tips on how to set up measurements, uh, and we'll go from there. See you then.